Diana Montalion. Perfect. That was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have an easy name, um, so there's a, a lot of practice. And what I'm discovering is that there are a lot of people who say my name better than I say my name. So I'm thinking of, of varying it. I think it's like rock, we all just want to be big rock stars. This is what it feels like. When I was 19, I was a theater major. I just wanted to go to, to theater school. And of course, my family is like, that won't lead to anything. And uh, now all the time, I think that's the best thing to do when I was young and I didn't mind being poor. Um, it lasts now the rest of my life. So thank you for coming in the nap. This is the nap session, right? <laughs> and uh, I appreciate that. Um, your willingness to join me here. We have a little bit of a pop quiz kind of thing in the middle to help raise up some energy, but we've also joked about bringing puppies and candy to, to help. So my name, as he said, ooh, ah, it's Diana Montalian, and I'm co-founder of Mentrix Group, and we predominantly work in enterprise content systems. And... I've been doing this for a really long time uh, in, well, in technology, which is not really a long time, but, um, and so I've seen a transformation, and fortunately that transformation has really helped me to think about some of the, the key factors that enable people to, um, to think in systems or design systems, and it's not potentially what you might expect, um, but We'll see what you think when, when I'm done. So we, um, hmm. oops, okay. So I am responsible, not single-handedly, for the content silos on the internet as much as anyone else did. Um, I began in Drupal, anyone else? Sorry. <laughs> and um, so when, when we needed to make bigger Drupal, right, bigger sites, bigger, bigger Drupal, um, we added lots and lots and lots of code to a single instance and varnish and, and um, multiple servers and, and all of that. And that was all, that was fine when you had a website and you wanted people to come to your website. Right? Worked, worked fine. But, and in the beginning even, we had, um, there, you know, uh, The Economist was one of my primary clients and they had a print edition and a digital edition. So two points of data, there's a little Python script that translates the XML. And then there's mobile, right? Then we need mobile versions. Then there's different devices. And then there's different contexts. And then there's apps. And then there's, um, social media, and then there's Apple News, and then there's uh, the films, and there's an audio edition, and there is um, topics. Things are collected by topics. There's more than one publication. And we have clients, um, so like um, Pfizer or Memorial Sloan Kettering, where all of their content is about um, is medical in information, or the Wikimedia Foundation, whose content is made by the entire world. And so it's not publishing specifically, it's when, there, when businesses depend on the, the sharing of, the exchange of content um, everywhere in the world, people are that they, that they, want, to, that they want to engage. So there's, mm, it's a very broad definition. But then we start to need some of the content sometimes in some context, or other types of content other times in other contexts, or a mixture of uh, images and galleries and, or by a, by a topic and, and semantic wiki data, or whatever now new products, product people are coming up with all kinds of ways to be able to, um, to, to use and interchange and leverage and meet the demands of um, create once, publish everywhere, of the fact that we're engaging from, from anywhere you can imagine. But this is what most of the, my, most of the situations look like, right? Now we have these giant um, uh, heavy software that is doing all, meeting all of the capabilities and it's huge and it's really hard to turn. Right, it's very hard to go in a different direction, and um, and so 
right now, they, I use the word modernization, right? But modernization, which really means microservices and event-driven and all these things, right? But it's, it's modernization, modernizing your, your content system is really about how to avoid obsolescence, right? Because you, if you can't um, make that change, then the model that you've built for your organization won't, won't make it, yeah? So the, the challenge is for sure technology, right? The, a lot of the technology is not mature enough even for us to be able to do the kinds of things that we can easily architect. Um, but the bigger problem is that we don't think in systems. And I, there, depending on the conference that I'm at, so yay, not this one, it's awesome, um, is the, what's an architect? Right? Even among a team of architects, we did not agree on what an architect was. And the, because I do enterprise systems architecture, I would define architect the way that we're learning here. Right? I mean, I consider myself, does anyone know, um, have read uh, The Magicians, Lev Grossman's book, The Magicians, or seen the, the, the US uh, series? You know, it's kind of Harry Potter for older people, uh, kids still, but, um, but basically magic exists in the world, but you don't know about it, and, and then one day you get an invitation to go take a test at this place called Break Bills, and it's a, a university for magicians, right? So then you discover this magicians. But in the, the people that don't get to go to Break Bills, that figure out magic is real, they have this kind of underground, by themselves, uh, on the side kind of... Uh, magic group, and they always kind of feel like they're crazy because no one seems to get what they're experiencing, and they're called hedge witches, right? So the, the hedge witches are the ones that don't go to break bills. And that's what I have experienced here, <laughs> is I feel like I'm the hedge witch. I've been out in the world having, using, trying to develop these words and having these conversations, and then we come and we study an approach like DDD, and it really just brings together everything that, you know, that I feel like I've suffered in the world to to learn, and one of the primary challenges, of course, is to help organizations, and this is the whole organization, right? Business and product and engineering begin to think in systems rather than the way that the content systems taught us to think, right? So we built features, and we had um, teams, the organization of teams kind of depended, but for a long time, there were teams that were the Drupal team, like naming ourselves after a technology, right? After a skill set. And what we really need to be able to do now is to think interconnected, right? To think, um, to think holistically, and especially to think emergence, right? So we need to be able to think and design processes that, that are greater than the sum of their parts, yeah? And so we're, this, this session is a bit more zen um, than, than others might have been in that we're going to drop underneath the, the framework, the ways of bringing um, systems thinking into, into practice. And we're going to focus on the core skill set that we practice in order to be able to engage well in those processes, right? Because fundamentally, we are the primary component in the systems that we occupy, and our teams are, and our organizations are. So hopefully, we'll take away some things that you can immediately begin practicing or investigating or discarding. If you think I'm wrong, that's great too. Um, but we're going to focus again, like I say, on a core, a core set of principles that might lead us to emergence, right? So I'm going to argue that um, emergence is something we practice, right? It's like mindfulness, right? It's not like one day you're suddenly able to stay focused on your breath, right? It's a thing that you practice. And emergence is a thing that we practice. And there are three main qualities we're cultivating, right? So how do you know if you're succeeding? How do you know if you're cultivating emergence in yourself, in the people around you, in the organization, and then in the systems? And the first one, we're going to base these on rules of emergent systems, like what we know are the qualities of emergent systems. And the first is that low-level rules create higher-level sophistication, right? So when we wanted to scale, we added varnish, 
lots and lots of caching to make a page load, right? We scaled from the top down. But systems don't do that. Systems take whatever the lowest level pattern is that's most often repeated, and that's what scales. Right? And you can see this absolutely everywhere, right? This is the, the problem, the big problem later was the problem that was generated in one single moment or one single pattern, right? All dysfunctional family uh, therapy is based on this rule, right? <laughs> and so, um, and so the, my, my favorite quote from Design Unbound, which is my favorite book of this year, I would highly encourage you, there are two volumes, highly encourage you to seek this out, also not on Kindle. Um, simple interactions among individual parts or agents form complex behaviors and patterns at the system level. So we are individual parts and agents. And that matters because, of course, as every speaker has said, Conway is right, right? The systems that come out of our interactions, the way we communicate and the way we structure thinking, will mirror the way we communicate and the way that we structure thinking. So the most impactful change that we can make is right here, right now, in the way we structure our thinking and communication. And to apply more science to that process so that we get in the end. Now, every time you have a bad pattern in a system, you have a bad pattern in a system because at one point, there was a pattern established that proliferated. And it's an important thing to add here that uncertainty is always a factor. And getting really, really comfortable with that. Like one of the reasons we have such a top-down approach in so many organizations is to try and give control over uncertainty. But any of us who've worked in that, which is all of us, know that, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, there's no way to, um, to make sure that nothing is, that everything is certain. Right? So we want, to, um, we want to get really comfortable with uncertainty being a factor and shift our goal from controlling an outcome to seeking the best possible solution under the circumstances, which means we need to understand the circumstances, which is what we've spent a lot of time learning how to do that, when conditions are uncertain. So the second rule is interact without central control. Now, emergent systems interact without central, um, also called um, executive control. And this is, this is perhaps the most scandalous thing that I am going to say, but fortunately not in this room, which is component mechanisms in an emergent system, they interact without central control. So they act in relationship to each other right, without directives from a central authority. So hierarchy does not give you emergence. It has a place, it has a purpose, it has a function, but it is not a quality that will then ever then deliver emergence, right? And so we want to be able to improve the ways that we interact with each other as individuals and as part of an agency. So the reason that we also know and have seen that this is so is because Brooks was also right, right? Brooks says conceptual integrity is the most important consideration in systems design. A frustration that I have and people have had when they've heard me talk about this is that Brooks doesn't define it and I don't define it. It's very hard to define, but I have come to define it as a practice. It's the practice of integrating concepts, of getting very good at conceptual work and the integration of those concepts among people, right? Because that's what then will give, um, will give you the system that you hope for in the end. Also, side note, in my copy of the Mythical Man Month, this is on page 42, which I just think is perfect. And the last quality is it depends on learning, right? And I'm, I, my quote here just says this, emergent systems depend, emergence depends on system learning, right? That we know that, um, that it is our proactive engagement in different perspectives, finding different perspectives, learning new tools, understanding new things, bringing proactively bringing uh, relevant information and multiple points of view into a system process that 
leads to emergence. So I'm not going to stay very long on that one because I think we, we agree. So to cultivate low-level rules that create higher-level sophistication, interaction without the need and self-control, central control, and learning, I'm going to advocate practicing argumentation. And argumentation is a tricky word to call that because it doesn't, maybe doesn't mean what you think it means. And then how we structure collective reasoning and also how we recognize when, we are, um, when our thinking is... Um, uh, not well-reasoned. And then at the very end, I'm going to recommend some developmental practices um, that feed our energy and enable us to engage that are, are really essential but almost never discussed, especially at technology conferences. So argumentation, or I call it the art of ambiguity, we can also call it the science of informal logic, which is what it is. It's informal logic. So, you know, those of us that come from the, you know, the computer science side, there's, a, there's plenty of the formal logic and a discrete math, which is one of my favorite classes. There's plenty of, of ability to think logically. And one of the things that surprises me is then how few of us understand that when you move into architecting, especially systems or enterprise architecting, it's still an incredibly logical process. It, it really is. It's very grounded. And it's not exclusively logical. It includes other things, like I'll say later, is, is intuition. But it's not soft. There's, there's really nothing, <laughs> really, I don't know, I've got lots of bruises from, from my career. I would say there's nothing really soft about it. And then part of it is because we don't, we have this, mm, I think we've not really strongly articulated what an informal logic process would look like. So I don't mean this, although it's incredibly entertaining. I don't mean debate and I don't mean fighting. As a matter of fact, you'll see um, there's a line in which you're no longer doing argumentation, and it's a line you'll recognize as when you're actually arguing. So it's not arguing. Um, and it is, and as I had said earlier, introduced the idea of the best possible solution under the circumstances when conditions are uncertain. And there's a really great, um, great courses course um, audio course on argumentation, and this is how he defines it as well, right? So this is when you're engaged in the process of what's the best possible solution under the circumstances when we don't actually know. So there are two parts. So this is where we're going to get as granular as we're going to get, because what we are really almost always doing the single transactional piece in most of our communicative transactions, right, so the lowest level, is that we're making some kind of claim. We have some idea about what's, what we might want to do. We have some perspective about what might help. We have some suggestion that we would like to make. Um, almost everything that we're articulating is our own formation of claims about what we think is so, right? So I'm going to give you some examples. So this is from Jane Austen, who's one of my favorite authors, so a literary example. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. And the reason I love this example is that all of her books are basically just this argument. This is what she's, she's demonstrating. So she opens it straight up. Whiteboard tests are a strong measure of a candidate's technical aptitude. I include this example because everybody seems to think this is so. <laughs> it's very universal. I don't know if it's universal everywhere, but it is in the US. Um, and it's interesting because I, the data, what's, hmm? <sighs> This one I actually took out of the New York Times two days ago. This is an American senator who made a claim that just because actions meet a standard of impeachment does not mean it's in the best interest in the, up to the country of removing a president from office. Now, I love this one because I'm going to keep this. This is basically the, yes, I committed a crime, but it's inconvenient for me to go to prison right now, so therefore, I'm not going to go. Uh, we should focus on encapsulation rather than the expansion of the core software. So I pick this because this is one um, 
that uh, that my colleague Kate and I, who who is here today, will uh, we're it's one we're working on, right? It's one we're working on um, helping helping to reason. So, you have your claim. And in a, in a world where we could just make claims and everyone listened to us and did exactly what we said because we're always right, it would be sufficient. But we don't live in that world, also we're not always right. So claims have to have reasons. We have to have reasons that justify and strengthen and make convincing the claim that we are making, right? And so we're going to take the, the example of we should focus on encapsulation rather than expansion of the core software. So some of the reasons are this will enable us to build modern software, pa software patterns without rewriting all the legacy code, unless you're someone who wants to rewrite all the legacy code. We can deploy the highest priority business goals quicker by integrating sources of content and establishing communication between them. And other similar systems, and here's where you'll want to give an example because examples are very powerful. Um, have adopted these patterns and have succeeded in accomplishing similar goals. So this sounds simple, but it's really hard. I really work very hard on these. And even as I'm preparing to talk, I'm trying to come up with examples. And I think, well, how about the umbrella example? You should bring an umbrella if it's raining. Well, why? Well, because you'll catch cold, but actually you won't. That's actually not true. It, there's not a data connection to that. Or, well, if you go to a meet, you, you're going to work and you're going to go into a meeting all wet, and that's what bad. Like well, you can't. So, so it's um, it's a constant practice, and it's a constant um, it's a constant practice. Bec also, because every time you're in a new situation with new people, they're going to have different different views on the reasons. Right? Um, so, the, but here's, why I, here's where, um, why I focus on it though, right? Is that every time a decision in the long run spurns a pattern that is not something that you want, there was a miss right here. One of the reasons or more of the reasons were somehow erroneous, and we didn't know, and that's, again, there's always uncertainty, so that is fine that that happens, but the reason we keep coming back to this as a core foundational practice, and again and again and again, is because the better we get at this, the higher percentage our outcomes will be, right? This is also why we must seek other people's point of views, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So an argument has um, a claim and its reasons of a claim. It's a very, it's a microservice. It's a little core package, right? And then it can be inductive or deductive. So deductive is what we're really familiar with, right? This is when you can know or you can find out. You're recommending a piece of software and it's a, to do a particular capability and you can actually find out whether or not the software provides you that capability. And inductive is when the best you're going to be able to do is probably. This is probably, probably so, right? And so when you go down the deductive path, it's deductively valid, right? So basically, you have discovered that it's true or you have proven that it is true, and that makes it sound. Now, we want all of our arguments to be sound. In other words, in any instance in which we are trying to, uh, to make a claim and give reasons or build reasons, we, of course, want to make sure that we've got our facts straight. So it's never one or the other. We're always combining both. But for our purposes today, because we're focusing on systems, we're focusing on inductively strong, right? So this means, does it hang together? This is conceptual integrity, right? Is it inductively strong? Does it follow? Does it hang together? And when it does, we say it's cogent, which means it's convincing, which means if reasonable people, which is, as an American, there are many things I can say about unreasonableness at the moment, but if it's reasonable people, then for the most part, it will follow and it will be convincing. Even if they disagree, they will at least have a very good sense of what the argument is, huh? what, it's, what it's trying to say, what it means, is it strong? 
And I'm going to add one more um, because in our work it, it matters equally, and that's does it matter? Uh, I had a wonder, and I love, one of the things I love about conferences is the little geek battles. Um, and coming home from, from dinner in the cab, we had a wonderful battle about Windows, um, IDE versus Mac. And I was throwing out, up out the window because people are talking about Windows being a good thing to develop on, right? Because, of course, I come from open source, so just, just Mac. And I love the, and we all hated Git together. It was wonderful. Um, so, so I love those. But do they matter to, generally speaking, deeply engage in debating, right? So one of the things when we're, when we're making claims and reasons and we're engaging with other people is this constant question of, are we putting our energy into the things that actually have the highest priority, have the highest value? Do they, do they matter? And so I would say that we're always bringing three things together, facts, inference, and weight. Is it true? Does it hang together? And does it, in the context in which we are, we are forming, we are communicating our thoughts or communicating our recommendations, does it have weight? And when you give reasons, you always want to include something that indicates why, why now? Why is this a priority to discuss now? So, we do this together, right? Because we can't possibly know. Our, we're not like our own little kingdom of, of coming up with our reasonable claims and then that's what's being implemented. We're doing it together. So I call this um, con collective reasoning. And I won't stay here very long because um, many wonderful speakers have made this point about seeking perspectives, right? That you're seeking other people's perspectives in order to, um, to work together to come, up with, um, to come up with the best possible solution under the circumstances. So collective reasoning, or we do this with other people, we're synthesizing knowledge, experience, and good judgment into decisions based on valid reasons. So this is also my definition of wisdom, right? So this is where you move away from seeking knowledge and move into seeking a combination of experience, good judgment, and knowledge when the conditions are uncertain based on reasons that are as strong as you can make them. So there are three poisons, right? There are three poisons, things that are constantly part of the collective reasoning process. That means you're not actually doing argumentation together. And the first one, as we said, is hierarchy. If there's anyone in the room that says, I don't care what you say, I don't care what you say, this one say, you're not engaging in argumentation. And it's fine, there is a place for that to happen, um, or because I said so, as a, as a as a parent, sometimes, because I said so, was the right thing to deploy. Um, but generally, that isn't argumentation, right? Also, change my mind, change my mind is not argumentation, because that person has no responsibility for engaging in the, in the reasoning. So this, this the core um, antidote to this poison is that everyone is there to strengthen the reasons. That's why you're there. Okay, we start with a basic set of reasons. Are they strong? Can I strengthen them? Do I have information or a different point of view? So when we're done with this, our reasoning, the way that it hangs together, is stronger. We've gotten rid of the weak ones and we've added some new, very strong ones. The second poison is the no culture. I'm sure you've not come across this, but a technology culture in which no matter what you say, the first answer is no, no, we can't do that, no, no, no. It's my first response to everything. Like, no, 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 because I haven't thought it through, right? No. But when we're engaging in collective reasoning, just like in improvisation, so when people do improvisational comedy, they practice and practice and practice yes and. You say yes to everything that happens. And if you don't, the whole scene falls apart. And if you adopted one practice, nothing else but one practice, this one changes things fast. It's quite surprising how if you condition yourself to say yes, and here's another thing we could consider, then the person says, oh, great. But if you're like, no, 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 that's wrong, it's this, and the other person closes down. Right? Same information, but it's landed if you start with yes and. 
So the third poison is that how often we're not solving the same problem. And this happens all the time, even among people that I think we're like we're in the bounded context of 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 like we've known each other for ever. Like we we have all the same language, and then we have a meeting and we think we're saying the same thing, and when we actually try to model it, we were not talking about the same thing, right? So there are two antidotes for this. The first is define everything, especially words like agile. Um, when you have people from different cross functions in the room, right? Everybody thinks they know what agile means, but if it matters to your reasoning that that people have a shared understanding of that word, then a light definition, just one or two words, something that um, that conveys what about agile you mean, right? So one of the exercises that I do, and it's it's very, I found it very transformational, is any time I make a technology model. Uh, any kind of infrastructure model, any kind of model that I'm doing, unless it's specifically for that purpose, I try and do it without any technology words, no technology words, just capabilities. And when I do that, I find that people who aren't going to implement it actually understand what I'm saying. And I'm embarrassed to say that it took me 10 years that people don't care about Drupal, JavaScript, AWS, all these other, we love these words, right? They don't care about that. They care about what the thing does, right? What does it do for them, right? So um, if you take away, if you, if you define everything or maybe undefine everything, it helps show where, um, where you might have some, some some misses in what you're communicating. The other thing is that, and this again, this is like a little mini thing, not an approach to the scale of something like, um, like DDD or Agile or these other approaches. This is just you in a meeting or you having a conversation. I have seen engineering teams transform using this. Um, I call it a top-down elaboration. And what it really means is if we're going to get together and discuss something, we are going to I have at least just a sentence, why is this valuable? And how will we know that this is valuable? And what are we talking about? What will I do differently once this is resolved? And who is involved? It's very interesting, this again, not solving the same problem, because you have people who are solving a user problem and a software problem and a business problem, and the way that they are going to be impacted is going to be different. So you bring it together to be clear who makes decisions, who is part of this, and then how, right? So lots of engineering teams, we, we just want to jump right in to talk about how, right? That's the point. But in fact, by pausing just to make sure we have the slightest bit of framework around each and every time we talk about uh, a solution. Um, and it, we can just make a document and always kind of use that, that document. But it makes sure that everybody sees. And what has happened is I've had meetings that never got to how because we quickly uncovered that the why and the what of a very small thing was completely derailed. So if we had kept going, we would have we would have to, it would have taken 10 times as long to do a very small thing because we actually weren't building the same thing. And when I add this a little to say, I, of course, am averse to when questions because never in the history of any time I've given an estimate has anyone heard the word estimate. Um, or they do hear the word estimate, but then they don't hear the word estimate. Um, and also, I don't know. I mean, this is always, this is always like, how long will this take? I, it will, I can tell you five minutes before I'm done how long it will take to do. And so, but people need to have that space of when, and, or we need to communicate if there's something that's going to happen that is going to be impacted by this that's happening on a certain date. So making visible the when piece, right? And so this just as kind of a daily practice, or we, even, just, even just if you're working in, in one or two weeks of planning, of making sure that there's, stay, you know, there's, always, there's always a good connection to the holistic view of the solution. Okay. So this would be great and wonderful, and we could stop right now if we didn't suck at this. 
but we completely suck at this, right? Our, our brains love to just take in all the easy ways of, of, of understanding things. We're not, we're not big examiners generally, although this conference is full of big examiners, which is wonderful, but we, we're easily swayed and we're easily swayed by emotions. So one of the things that is really helpful to, to practice and investigate is being able to recognize conceptual fallacies. And the way that this happens in me, or um, logical fallacies, or great websites that um, have fun quizzes, is that I be in a situation and I'm just like, this is wrong. This is just, this is nope. This is wrong. But I don't know why, right? Something's being said or something's not hanging together and I don't know why. And it, it's, it's hard work and it, it continues to be for me to be able to figure out why I'm having this reaction. Right? And even harder for me to then be able to yes and offer something else when a conceptual fallacy arises. And the reason it's so hard for me is that I'm having the same, you know, I have the same fallacious thinking, right? So I, I, I sense it, but I don't actually know what it, what it is happening. So let's practice. Let's do one. Let's see. And if you were there... If you've, seen me, if you've seen me speak in the last year, I did not change the quiz thing, so you don't, sorry, but you would be cheating. So don't shout them out if you know them already. Okay, so here we have six common um, conceptual fallacies, logical fallacies. So if I say, of course Arthur suggested that, he, over, he loves to overcomplicate everything. He overcomplicates everything. Which is that? Ad hominem, yes. That just because Arthur overcomplicates everything, which, bless his heart, he does, um, doesn't mean he's wrong. Doesn't mean he's wrong. Doesn't mean it's overcomplicated, right? That it's talking about and putting down the person as opposed to what it is that they're, that they're saying. This is beta, but nobody's reported any problems, so it'll be fine, we'll be fine. Nope, did you say number four? Five, appeal to ignorance, right? Just because no one's had a problem with it doesn't mean there isn't a problem. It just means we don't know yet whether or not that there's a problem. We didn't have good tools or enough time, so we're not responsible for the outage. Appeal to pity. Yeah, so it, 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 it may be possible that not having enough tools or enough time um, what is not the responsibility of of a particular team and therefore not really responsible for, the, for the, the outage, that might be true, but the only way this statement holds up as true is if you bring in pity for their circumstances, right? Oops, cheating. Did it cheating? Yeah, oh no, okay, good, all right, good, sorry. Uh, you, wanna you wanna use Joomla? Ad populum. Just because something's not popular doesn't mean it's not the right answer. If GraphQL times out, it sends the front end a timeout error. The timeout error got a front, got a, sorry, the front end got a timeout error, therefore GraphQL is timed out. Yes. Uh, it's affirming the consequence. Did someone say that? Did you guys say four, six, say six? Affirming the consequence. It's um, it's yes, it, if A, then B, but not necessarily if B, then A. Oops. Now you know what the last one is, but this is right. Lack of Kubernetes is our problem. We hear this, this is, a, this is a very popular one in tech. It's saying, the fact that I don't have a tool is the problem, and so if you get me the tool, it will fix the problem, right? As opposed to actually making the argument for what the problem is. Yeah. Okay, so that's all the mind stuff. That's uh, informal logic, argumentation, logical fallacies, all of these things. They're, um, uh, anything that we do, reading it, consuming it, studying it, listening to audiobooks on it, will help cultivate our ability to, um, to form claims and reasons, and then the better we get at that, the better we are at engaging then in collective reasoning, and the better we are at engaging in collective reasoning, the better we are at designing emergent systems, right? 
but there are also some foundational practices without which we can't be very successful because the mind is in the body <laughs> and is in our feelings. We are one whole piece. In technology, we forget that a, a lot, right? But we are one whole piece. So for example, self-awareness, right? If you don't know what you think or what you are experiencing or when your monkey symbols is going, then you can't actually make claims and, and reasons, right? So um, I get up every morning and um, I'm like now suddenly embarrassed to tell you this. I don't know why. I get up every morning, I make coffee, and I write by hand with an hour, for an hour, with a fountain pen. So I do this because it's, I listen to myself, right? Uh, and I kind of live in a world, as, as many of us do, that isn't great necessarily at listening the first 10 times I say something. So I, I have a practice of being able to, um, to develop self-awareness. What's really going on? Um, there are lots of ways of doing this, even just having coffee with someone who knows you well, who's going to call you on your bullshit when you, <laughs> when you go off. But, but I want to encourage associating self-awareness practices with our ability to, to mentally handle comple complex situations, because they go together. If you're not aware of your own reactions, then you're going to just be projecting those. Right? So anything that develops self-awareness um, is very valuable. Intuition. So I'm going to tell you a story because intuition can be the woo-woo section of, of the talk. Even though Einstein says that every, uh, every scientist who's moved us to a place we weren't before has talked about the value of intuition. Um, but this is Isabella Lande. She is anybody familiar with her novels? Yeah, beautiful. So uh, she's a South American writer, and uh, she came to the U.S. when there was a coup in in her country, and she was working on a novel. And in the novel, she needed to get information from one place to another during a, a war time, a very violent time. She couldn't figure out how to do this. And then in her mind, she saw a priest on a bicycle. And she thought, well, that's great, because a priest would be able to move around without attracting too much right, violence in this. So, um, so she, in her novel, there's a priest on the bicycle that, that um, takes this information to where it needs to be. And sometime later, my, I remember it is 20 years, but I don't know, uh, she's in her house, and there's a knock on her door. And she opens the door, and it's the priest asking her, how'd you know? And when she tells this story, she tells it on a panel of other writers, and they're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that happens. That happens all the time, right? So what is it that gives us a knowing? And systems design definitely relies on this sense of things that we can't actually knowledge know and the ability to listen to those things, right? And so how do we make space in our... Um, how do we make space in, in our work to leave place for where we have to kind of make up what, what the gaps are and how these gaps are being bridged? Because oftentimes you get really good information from that. And so where this can go woo-woo is like tarot cards, right? Or it's not like this is where, you know, that's not science. I don't believe in, in, in prognostication tools. But one of the things that I really like about tarot, for example, is it cre it's, an, it's an archetypal... Um, construct into which I tell a story, right? I, I say what I think this means. And often if we ask ourselves questions that are not linear, we, we find out information about the, the patterns in our lives that we wouldn't have been able to get any other way. And it's not, I would argue, prognostication. I would argue that we are much more pattern aware than we think we are. So empathy, of course, because empathy is seeking to understand, right? So in a culture in which you're like, change my mind, there's no empathy, right? We're not seeking to understand. So developing uh, more and more our empathy is not the same as sympathy. It's not, it's not the same, and it's kind of, I would argue, not the same as compassion. It's practicing the habit of seeking to understand, where other people are coming from, do not have to agree with them. And their, their claims and their reasons can be complete and utter trash, right? 
but you can still be seeking to understand them. Hmm? So, so this one I sneak in at the end, and I feel very strongly about it, but A, I don't have science to bring it up, and B, I think that, um, I, I think someday we'll talk more about this, but it's still a very sort of uh, quiet side of our, of our life. And that is that um, we need to have energy to do what we're doing, right? These are hard. It's hard to do what we, to think and to engage and to structure and to, and to um, change hearts and minds, our own and everyone else's. And then also we forget that the fact that the stuff that we're building is really complicated. Like we're not doing simple things, even if we didn't have to do all that other stuff in order to be able to do it. So we need energy. And when I started, um, I worked all the time. And I was Sisyphus. I, the more that needed to get done, I'd push the rock up the hill. But then I discovered that the rock rolls back down the hill, often right over me, and then I have to do it again. And then, and you know, as, on leadership, as I move into leadership roles, and I multi there's just multiple rocks and multiple hills, right? And what I discovered is that I wasn't renewing energy in between these kinds of engagements in a way that was strengthening my ability to be with whatever it was that I was that I was experiencing, and. Um, and, you know, it would be things like, oh, if I smoke a cigarette, then I can think and I can go to this meeting. So once you get to that point, right, you're not renewing your energy. And so, um, you know, I think I don't have to argue too much that there's a direct link, but there's an integral connection between embodiment or bodily experience and knowledge. The corporal awareness informs it. So we know this if, you know, hangry, right? You're not doing your best thinking when you're hangry. Right? And how many, no one's been in a relationship likely in their entire life where they haven't said something really regret. <laughs> Only later it's just because they were tired, right? They're tired. So I would argue that one of the most essential things to, to systems thinking is eating real food. But I say this very quietly because this is not kind a of thing. But that um, you know, as your blood sugar goes up and down, as the as you know, again with hangry, uh, where we're not having enough nutrients if we're not. And I've experienced this personally that the more I um, that I don't have processed food and have plants, I have regular um, joyful relationship with um, actually eating vegetables, um, and not just fats, and, and you know, I do eat meat, but the, the point is, the better my diet was, the better my renewable energy. So I will just encourage you, if you think maybe you're struggling with that, to, to consider exploring that first before anything else and just see if it makes a difference. Also go outside, um, because we are developing pattern awareness, and yet we live in an emergent system that is the most magnificent and will never, ever understand. And so because we're absorbing the same kinds of pattern recognition all the time, it's really beneficial to us to be in different patterns, or, or in natural patterns, right? To, to go out and be quiet, but listen to other forms of communication. Right? I had a Buddhist teacher after September 11th, I was saying that it was really, um, uh, sorry, so September 11th, is that translate to, I, I'm such an American. I went to the bookstore in Amsterdam when I got here. I was so excited to go to the bookstore and I had a moment of being surprised that the books weren't in English. That this, this what it, until I remember, right, because this is how we're raised, like it's us, and then there's just everything else, but that's like behind us, right? That I keep being surprised. So I say, September 11th, someone pointed out that if you're from the US and they ask you where you're from, you say the state as if the whole rest of the world knows all the states in the United States of America and where they are, right? Fortunately, I'm from New York, so most people do, in fact, do that. So anywhere from September 11th and uh, a Buddhist teacher, I was saying, I can't stand it. Everybody is saying all this stupid stuff. Like, I lived in a place where no one liked George Bush, and now everybody's saying, get behind the president. Off a cliff? No, there's no. And he said, he said, go outside, Diana. There are other things to communicate with besides humans. Right? The whole world is communicating, and immerse yourself in that. And then the other thing is to do other hard things. So, um, so for me, I've been um, 
uh, cycling in my in my home. I've been cycling, and there's this really cool woman in New York who um, teaches these classes, and she's like the best leadership training ever. And I get realizing that because I, I'm so busy doing these hard things that I forget to do other hard things, you know, other things that develop balancing kinds of strength. And so now I'm actually challenging myself to do other things with other people, rhythmic kinds of things that I, I might find challenging, but as a counterbalance so that when I go back to the the predominantly mental socio-technical challenges, I'm actually renewed if I did something hard that wasn't that, right? It gives me a little bit of a little bit of space. So my last slide is a question slide, but we are going to be, we're not going to do questions so that the speaker after has space and time to to set up. I hate when I'm the following one and it gets late. Although he said he has no stress about this whatsoever, so taught me a Zen moment. Um, but I'm here for the rest of the afternoon if you have questions. And also, a lot of the, the people, especially the other speakers here that I connected with, we had this little tribe on Twitter. I know Twitter is a trash can, but it's actually been great um, for, for me personally. So if you happen to, to be there, um, then please feel free to find me and this will also, you will also find uh, other like-minded people. Yeah. So thank you for not falling asleep during the nap time session. And if you did fall asleep, totally fine. I'm glad you were comfortable enough, right? Thank you.